Welcome to the Service MVP Podcast. And my name is Joe Crisera, America's Service Sales Coach. And we have with us today, Mr. Seth Yuri, and he is with Goodly, uh, which is a uh, the gift of affordability that he gives contractors every single day. Seth, welcome to our program. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Joe. It's a lot of did, fun. I pronounce, did I pronounce your last name right, Seth? You know, you can call me whatever you want. It's, it's That's fair know, enough. Uh, you know, I have family I, members who disagree about pronunciation, so you did just learn. That's good. Well, I'll tell you what, I... Uh, I have the same thing. I don't care. Just call Just call me. I don't care if you call me what you pronounce it right. Uh, and Seth, let's go over a little bit about the, uh, you work at Goodleap and you're one of the top representatives and, you know, you know I, used, I, used, I have a, I have my own connections there, but definitely your name just keeps popping up all over the place. It sounds like you're really digging to make connections with contractors across the country. How's it been going over you? How's your career been uh, working with Goodleap? How, how are you enjoying your job and uh, telling me some of the rewarding things that you get out of this job, uh, Seth? Yeah. I had a uh, boss a long time ago. I worked at Daikin for about six years, and one of my bosses there was like a Wharton grad, and he was he consulted for Bain for you know like ten years. And he said, "If the only thing you're getting out of your job is a paycheck, you're getting cheated." Mm. And I've I've really taken that to heart, and I've lived that way. And so, uh, you know, Good Leap has helped me in the sense that I get a lot more than a paycheck, right? Like I get the responsibility to manage people. I get the opportunity to interact with lots of interesting people like you, um, interact with lots of contractors. So um, what's the Emerson quote? Every man is my superior in some way. And in that way, I can learn from him. And I just think we have a job where we get to talk to a lot of people. And it's awesome because you talk to people and you're I'm always surprised at the things I learned when I'm talking to people and just listening to what they have to say. Well, I would say your boss had a lot of wisdom. And so that is, that's a good quote. I, mean, I had a chill down my spine when you said that. It's amazing. Thank you. I'm sure listeners are going to have that too. So you, you knocked it out of the park. A sharp single up the middle on your first uh, <laughs> your first few minutes here. Uh, <clears throat> let's go a little bit about the need uh, for the financial aspect to assist the consumers uh, to give them the gift of affordability, which I hate to use the word, but the word financing, right? Which is yeah, that's yeah. on the table. But uh, tell us a little bit about um, today, why it's more important today to be able to offer financing to all your clients uh, as opposed to back in the day where it was kind of an afterthought. People did it just to see yeah. if they could like pick up a sale here and there uh, as an yeah. afterthought. Tell us why it's so important today. I had a, a contractor who told me that financing is the one F word that contractors don't like using. And uh, so, but I think it's hilarious. You know, if everybody who's listening to this has experienced what happened over the last three to four years, which has been one price increase after another. I don't care what industry you're in. Everybody sees prices are up like crazy. Um, you know, take an example, let's say HVAC industry. I know you have a lot of HVAC contractors listening to you. Um, four years ago, the average price of a base efficiency HVAC system across the country, nationwide average, 7,800 bucks. OK, mm -hmm. they're projecting by the end of 2024, that number is going to be over fifteen thousand dollars. So we're talking about nearly doubling in uh, four years. Right. And we're not even out of the woods yet because we have refrigerant change, reg regulatory changes coming. There's there's still stuff coming. Right. We're not all the way out of the price increases. And so when you consider that, you think, wait a second, 10 years ago, that ticket was thirty five hundred bucks four years ago. It was seventy eight hundred bucks. In the next nine months, it's going to be fifteen thousand dollars. Well, Not when you do when you do our program, Seth, that here at Service MVP, uh, the average the average sale, listen to this, is thirty is about twenty eight to thirty two thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, be, be, because the reason is when you work the Daikin or the Duckless solutions. When you start saying that's the future of HVAC, it's not just the price increase, uh, but it's the innovation. <clears throat> to me, the most premium solution is everybody gets a personal heating and air conditioning system in every room of the house. Mm -hmm. So that that's going to cost, you know, seventy nine thousand for some of those solutions. Uh, you're probably going to settle at something, or it might be a hybrid between that. So definitely, with the new innovations uh, that are being financed, it's not just the equipment; it's everything, plus the yeah. service memberships. And all. So it's all that kind of stuff that comes with it. Uh, that I'm saying, you're right, fifteen thousand. It's being very conservative. I think you're 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 probably going to see eighteen twenty thousand with the average person, but with the most premium companies, it's going to be at that thirty two, uh, probably thirty six thousand very quickly. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to suck that up. Yeah, I, I visited a Tesla dealership this last week. You know, not that I'm necessarily going to buy a Tesla, but I was curious, right? 
So I was talking to the salesperson and they can take the tax credit of 7,500 bucks right off the top of the purchase. So they have nice. a Model Y, right? There's a Model Y and it's got three rows. I have five kids. So I'm like, what's the mm-hmm. biggest Tesla, you know? But it's got three row seating. Do you know what the price, the base price of the Tesla Model Y after the tax credit comes off the top? $32,000, exactly what you just said. So the question is, crazy? how many Tesla Model Ys would they be selling without financing? Well, it's, it's, I tell you what, I bought two Teslas. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm uniquely qualified to tell you that it's the easiest. It's the easy. It's like buying a Tesla is the easiest hundred thousand dollars you're ever going to spend. For my, for me, I got the X, yeah. Model X and the Plaid and everything like that. So, but but it's like, yeah, just give us a hundred dollars down and get pre-approved. Just give us your social security number, and we'll get pre-approved. Uh, yeah. I got, I got, I was very lucky during the pandemic. Uh, I got my interest rate at two point one percent. They almost said they they yeah. gave me that money. They gave me that money free. Yeah, it's basically I'm like that's free, and uh, I'm like hell yeah, hundred dollars down. And they uh, all of a sudden they said, hey, your car is here. What? It's in your front yard. What? And then uh, you know it's cra- it's crazy. But you know what? Uh, the financing. If they if they asked me to come up with a hundred thousand dollars, I would have been like, oh, I got to pontificate on that. Yeah. Forever. Like I I'd still be yeah. thinking about it now even. But when they said that two point one financing or you know the monthly payment would be this, and that's what it would have came out to the monthly payments are super affordable. So I'm yeah. like, huh. It's like I'm already wasting that much money on my current vehicle, getting the brakes done and everything else like that. I'm also Yeah. I mean, truthfully, it didn't make sense financially, but truthfully, I'd like I don't I'm done with the hassle. I want something more simple. And when I got one, then my wife got envious and she got one next year. So yeah. <laughs> it's like, but it's, but it's make they make it super easy. Give us a hundred dollars do. down, and we'll get the rest thing going. I think it's a real good example of that model. And yeah. whether you like a Tesla or not, I think all the all the car dealerships oh, yeah. have figured out that the average car is going to cost forty thousand or whatever kind of a thing. You well, might as well. One yeah. more note: I asked the salesperson. I said, "How many of the base models do you sell at that thirty-two thousand dollars?" And he said, "Almost none." Everybody, mm. I just wanted the upgraded models. Why do you hmm. think that is? Because it ends up being about fifteen to twenty-five dollars more a month when you spread that payment out. I think now I wonder if a homeowner who has an option to buy a fully variable speed system with multi-head with a couple different mini splits on there and a full five-inch media filter, whole home filtration system, are they more likely to get an upgrade when it's only fifteen to twenty dollars more a month? Well, the answer is yes. Yeah, <laughs> I'll give you the short answer on that. <laughs> that and, uh, so I think we're on the same page, man. You're like a brother from another mother. This is like the uh, I feel like I'm with somebody I've I should have known for years, but then now I will. So that's great. Yeah. Seth, let's go over some of the let's pivot if you don't mind. I, I think the, the I said the, I think the gift of affordability says it all. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're if you're hesitating on this, uh, if you're out there in the field selling things. Uh, it shouldn't be something that you throw in at when you're scrambling to get the job. Like, oh yeah, how about if we how about if we finance it? It's like, no, nah, I'm good. You know, you're going to get that negativity from the client because you use because they're going to say, if you could have financed it, why didn't you offer that to me to begin? So the mark of a bad service professional, I feel, is somebody who scrambles to offer that as an afterthought rather than somebody who makes it the primary offer. Let's talk a little bit about that best practice. Um, yeah. You know, number one, uh, putting it in your software. So what are some of the things that you can do to make sure that uh, would you recommend, number one, that it is the primary offer or you think it should be something we offer as a secondary thing? Let's go ahead and talk about that a little bit. I, I think if you consider the fact that uh, only 5% of the country has more than $15,000 in savings, and if you consider the fact that only 8% of the country is making over $100,000 a year, and two-thirds of them are living paycheck to paycheck by their own admission. So to me, if I just look at my average homeowner, I should be offering financing every single time because I'm going to be right 95% of the time. Mm-hmm. And the people who have the money, guess what? They have no problem telling you they have money. You know, I'm going to pay cash for this. You know, what would it take just to buy? If I wanted to just write a check, what would it take? Well, if I said it was 36,000, what would happen then? Yeah, we just do it then. All right. So we got the financing. But, you know, if you offer it primarily, I think it's, it, to me, it shows that the, the, the person who's giving the solutions has put thought into this to make it as comfortable for the customer as possible. Is that a good way of putting it, Seth? What do you feel about that? Yeah. I mean, I think that's absolutely right. I also think that every person listening to this podcast has had an experience where they rolled into a really nice neighborhood, went to a big home. And the people had no money and they might not even gotten qualified for financing. And they've also had the opposite experience where they went to a home where they really were kind of wondering if these people could afford it. 
and the people paid them in hundred dollar bills. So the lesson is stop prejudging your customer. Don't assume that you know who has money and you know who doesn't or who needs financing and who doesn't. If you just assume everybody needs financing, you're giving them options. They can tell you no. Always it, it, that financing option. You know, and when we when we here at Service MVP rank the priority score of a client, financing puts it at the top score because mm-hmm. financing provides more 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 uh, resources, financial resources than a credit card normally does and that your check your checking account has the least amount of resources most likely yeah. and cash is very minimum resource so if i look at somebody's going to say i'll just pay cash for this thing i'm like oh great this guy doesn't have any money so he's probably how much mm-hmm. how much money he probably thinks it's 5000 in cash that's not going to that's not going to cut it with that 15000 dollars even so yeah. really you can make a case that almost 100% of the people would need some financing to get them over the hump cuz mm-hmm. if you had to say what's the expectation of the consumer based on what they see online and what's the reality when the salesperson gets out there? That's always the sticker shock, right? Like the cars advertising, hey, get a new car for like, you know, eighteen thousand dollars for Chevy something or whatever. And you go in there, it's like, where's that Chevy? Oh yeah, the one that you want is like forty two thousand. Oh mm-hmm. okay. okay. Well, what happened at eighteen thousand? What's well, the base model? You want to go with that? It's got yeah. AM radio or whatever, yeah, <laughs> whatever, whatever they got in that one. Yeah, it's like that's like the bait and switch that they. But seriously, I think the get the reality is that. You know, consumers think it's probably seven, five thousand, like you said there, but the reality is the fifteen thousand or the thirty thousand. So you should have it just to make sure you're bridging that gap, so that people don't feel like I'm st- like because because tr- truth is, I felt when I went to car dealers and they just threw the full price at me. If I ever seen that, I'm like, holy crap, I am stupid. I thought that. So it, it makes the self esteem of the consumer lower yeah, because 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 you're like, oh crap. I thought it was going to be 7,000. I didn't know it was going to be like 29,000 or whatever. I'm just, stu- and then they feel stupid. And I tell yeah. you what, Seth, when somebody has low self-esteem, uh, do you think they want to treat themselves to something really good? Well, tell us about that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I think oftentimes, like I always make this comparison of if you've ever been in a grocery store checkout line and there's someone mm-hmm. around you whose car gets declined, what do they always say? They don't say, I spent all my money on cigarettes. Now I can't afford four food for my family. They don't say that. They say, my bank must have screwed something up. There's some fraud on my head. They will never tell you because they don't want to feel stupid. And they're still super embarrassed. And, you know, heating and cooling, plumbing, electrical, these are mandatory must-have services. You, you don't get to choose about whether you buy food or whether you live in a home that's air-conditioned in Phoenix, right? That's something you have to have. And you're putting this homeowner in a position where they feel stupid. They don't have the money and they don't want to tell you that. They don't want to admit that. People will very rarely just admit, I don't have the money. But what will happen is they will invent about a thousand smokescreen objections to cover the fact that they don't have money. And they'll say, I'd like to get more bids. I'd like to talk to my wife. I'd like to do more research. Underneath all of it is, I don't have the money. And if you can solve the money problem up front, and I'll tell you a really fast, easy way to do this, right? This is a great sale best practice is... Hey, you know, Mr. Smith, in, I've given you a lot to think about. In three minutes, we can get a free sneak peek into which programs you qualify for. It's not going to touch your credit. They'll probably make it easier to make a decision. Want to go and do that really quickly? You know, mm. it's a smooth pull. Let's just try to get a quick, that. kind of get a little quick uh, commitment to the payment program that'll make it exactly. affordable before you show them the price. Exactly. I'm just looking. And here's here's the numbers. We pulled the numbers on this, right? If a person applies for financing and gets approved, 81% of them move forward with the project. Hmm. So it's, you know what? I agree. That's why, that's why when we answer the phones, we try to ask people, so how are you going to be investing in this today? You're going to use our a low interest bridge loan or a low payment bridge loan. You're going to use a credit card or you're going to use a check uh, when you make, when you eventually make the purchase and they go, I'm probably going to use that bridge loan. Well, can I go ahead and send you a a soft credit pool? Uh, which would be no, we have it when you have any impact on your thing. So we do the same thing, even mm-hmm. on answering the phone. Here's what we found, Seth. Yeah. Would you believe this? If you offer that ability to get a pre-approved before a guy comes out, before a guy comes out there, 37% of people will actually do that. Do you believe that? If they have if they offer it on the phone, even. So then if you did it on the phone, that same thing, and then the salesperson does the same thing, pretty much the consumer gets the uh, idea like, 
I guess that's just how we do it here with this stuff. That's just a normal way of doing it, right? You kind of normalize the fin- the part of it, the, the program you're talking about there, right? Yeah, yeah. You have to give people permission to take out financing because they might have these preconceived notions in their mind about how that's irresponsible or they should just be paying for this. Or if you can't afford it, you shouldn't buy it. But the reality is they can't afford it. So you have to normalize it through saying things like, you know, 85% of our customers go to one of our standard programs because it's so much easier. I mean, the takeaway is people will buy the best they can afford. People will buy the best they can afford. I really like what you're saying there, Seth. And one of the the things I'm seeing here when you're saying that is that you're anticipating the needs of the client, number one, to be able to find find the resources financially for them. But number two, you're preparing them for the fact that there will be a monthly payment or it will be a program where we're going to give you that money and give you the job. Make sense? So mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to go to my, I, we can't do this project. It's going to cost us too much money. And truthfully, I can't tell you this, Seth, after shopping for heating and air conditioning services myself here in Playa Vista, California, I tried to get people to say, you know, what do you got for me on a, a payment? A payment? Like, I'd be like, oh, gee. like they acted like I was pulling their teeth to get the service provider to offer it to me. I'm like, don't you have financing on this? It's like 39,000 we're gonna spend. I did ductless in my entire house. I took out the ductless system, put in ductless. Uh, I won't say the brand name or anything like that, but uh, truthfully, and I, I wanted it that way, right? And I said, well, mm-hmm. they're gonna go, that's gonna cost a lot of money. I'm like, dude, can you finance it? Oh, I have to check and see what we got, right? They were unprepared in a way, does that make sense? Yeah. So I would say the vast majority, and you probably know this because uh, so if, I, if you looked at it, Seth, you, can you give me some statistics? How many people are using this as the primary offer as opposed to people who are like act like it's a like it's a burden on the contractor? How many people are more like uh, really set up for this? If you looked at all the contractors in the country versus so there'd be you'd be if you did this, you'd be in a select group. I'm saying what would the percentage be of people who actually offer financing as the premium as the primary offer? Would you say let me answer that with this statistic right here. The top 10% of all contractors are funding 90% of all finance jobs. I guess that says it right there. The, question 10, the top comes, 10% finance yeah. of 90% of all the sales. Yeah. The 10%. Are the they people. are they big because they're offering financing or do they offer financing because they're big? And I think it's pretty obvious they got big by offering financing. You know, that is true. That is true. Yeah. So, so if you want, you're saying, how do these companies, so whenever you say like, uh, <clears throat> I remember I was in a room with, uh, at, we have our true grit, uh, uh, you know, our uh, event we have, <clears throat> we have, uh, we had five contractors who grew from zero to $40 million, start up to 40 million in five years. And yeah. all of them use financing as the primary offer. Now I'm not saying it's the only reason, but it is an in- integral component that says uh, I'm not going to grow to 40 million in five years unless I can make sure consumers can afford my solutions. Because you don't get there by doing nickel and dime jobs. You mm-hmm. get there by making sure you're doing the big ones. So you you got to hit a. It's like baseball season's coming up, right? You know, mm-hmm. getting a dribble one back to the pitcher and he fumbles the ball and you get an error. That's one way of getting on base. But you know what? Hitting the ball out of the park uh, with bases loaded. Uh, it makes a lot more runs and it makes you win the game. Does that make sense there? And this is very similar to what you're talking about in finance. You get a lot more home runs when you've got the bases. In a way, you're loading the bases with the financing. Is that a good analogy? We think you know, that? That's a great analogy. In fact, I, had, I was training a group of territory managers who worked for some distributor out in Georgia. And there was one of them who had just started three weeks ago. And I did my training. And he came up and he's like, you know, what you said about people not offering this is so true because I had to replace my HVAC system. And I had to throw a call three different contractors before one of them finally offered me financing. And I said, yes, because I couldn't afford it. So to extend the analogy, it's almost like, look, if you're not offering financing, you're always on deck, but you're never actually up plate because people cannot buy if they don't have the money. You're never going to take a full swing at the ball as it comes to you if they cannot even afford it, right? So in order to get even up to the plate where they can even make a buying decision and say yes, you have to give them the money so they can say yes. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I think I think probably you know fifteen uh, percent would have thirty thousand dollars, or maybe even less than probably five percent would have thirty thousand yeah. dollars in their account, but a hundred percent would have two ninety seven in their account <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> is that does that make sense? Like because yes. you're because because you can make the case. You could say 
you know, you're wasting money on utilities, you're wasting money on repairs, you're wasting money on the price increase that's happening. Those are so you, you balance out the wasted money there. You know, it used to be like, how can we show finance? How can we show that the system will pay for itself? Uh, well, it's hard to say that thirty thousand dollars is ever going to pay for itself, but it's easy to say you're wasting <clears throat> two ninety seven a month on utilities, on repairs, on the price increase. You take those strings, those three things only, and mm-hmm. say that easily could stretch it out to say, hey, within ten years, you're going to get all your money back on this system in a way. Does that make sense, sir? Yeah, I mean, you're balancing the value that they're getting out of it against the price. And so I always ask, hey, if you put a really high efficient, like your system, right? You've got $30,000 system in there with all kinds of many split systems. When do you recognize the return on that investment? Oh, every month for the next 15 years. So if I'm trying to create value, so they're willing to pay it, isn't it so much easier to justify the value when I match the payment against the return on that investment on a monthly Mm -hmm. basis for the next 15 years? Why not tie those two things together rather than saying, give me $30,000 right now. And I will slowly pay you back for the next 15 years. That's crazy. You know, and truthfully, on my utility bill, I could make the case because let's put it this way. I'm only heating and cooling 200 to 300 square foot at a time. Yeah, on top yeah. of the fact the system is like 10 times more efficient. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we are down to about $98 a month on that utility bill when we used to be at 475 um, a month or something like that. I mean, in California, yeah. that is unbelievable. It, it really is. So that's crazy. So it's like, I'm, I'm literally paying, it literally pays for it. So it, I didn't, I did not use a bridge loan because nobody had it at that time. I just bought it out of my pocket. Now I'm thinking about it. I'm like, that was stupid. I should have waited till I found somebody who did that. But nonetheless, uh, let's go into the other part of it there, Seth, about the interest rate. So the different programs that are available, that's what you guys call them there. Tell us a little bit about the programs and let's talk about the value. Should I, there's so much to choose from. Sometimes the salespeople, that's one, I think that's one of the reasons people are st- stopped because they're not sure what's better. Is it the del- I hear people do delayed payments for 12 months, same as cash or six months, same as cash, the monthly payment with a low interest, 0% interest for three years or a 15 year, 8.9 or something. Let's go over um, some of the best practices of which we should choose. Uh, I got my own ideas, but go ahead and tell us where you go. You go, yeah. it's your podcast. You tell us first, <laughs> what do you think? I will tell you my opinion about what you should do. And then I have a few opinions about what you don't do, right? Mm-hmm. So what you should do is you select really two loans because you have two kinds of buyers. You have a monthly payment buyer and you have a cash buyer. Your cash buyer is probably 20, 25% of your people. A cash buyer loves nothing more than interest-free money, right? 0% for 12 months is a super popular loan because guess what? Anything that's going to happen in their life is going to happen in the next 12 months. After that, it's just a repeat. I don't need to give you 24 months. You're going to get a bonus or a tax return or something like that in the next 12 months. If you're a cash buyer, you can pay it off in 12 months. So I don't need to pay for all this additional no interest time. That's really just good money after bad. I give you 12 months. You're going to be satisfied with that. If you're not a monthly payment buyer, what you're looking for is the lowest possible monthly payment. You're thinking, here's my budget. I make this much. I spend this much. I have this much left over at the end. If you can tell me a payment that fits into that amount, I'm going to say yes. And so the most popular loans for a monthly payment buyer are a 15-year loan. Um, And there's really two loans that are the most popular. I'll tell you why. 15 years at 12.99% is free. There is no dealer fee on it costs less than a credit card, right? So if you did nothing more than start converting all of your credit card usage over to a 15-year 1299, you would save tens of thousands of dollars in credit card fees and you would have more approvals. So that's the first part. The second part is a 15-year 9.99 is also a super popular loan. Now it does have a fee. It's got a 7.25% fee. and But it's so popular because even if I'm somebody with an 800 credit score, 9.99 on an unsecured personal loan today with today's interest rates, that is not bad. I'm just about ready to faint when I hear that. That's, I mean, I would have, I would have went with that one in a heartbeat. I didn't even, oh my gosh. Cause I mean, seriously, when you think about how, how low that brings the monthly payment down, it is crazy. And 9.9 is certainly, certainly, I wouldn't say, let's put it this way, guys. You're saying it's, what'd you say? 7.25% is the deal with me? Yes. Now, let's put it this way. It's really not 7.25%. I'm going to make a little bit of a case for you. I'm going to give you a little bit of a uh, help on this one because <laughs> because you've already got 3% for credit cards built into everything you do. Uh, exactly. You're really looking at 4.25% more 
just to offer this to clients. Just all you have to do is build that into your margins overall, over all the financing you do. I mean, seriously, it's a no brainer. This to me uh, brings this down to where there's zero reasons because I think a lot of people get into the thing where it's like, oh my God, if I do the 0% financing, it's going to be like 15% for three years or whatever. And I'm like, dude, uh, why are you doing that? Why don't you do 9.9 or 8.9 over 10 years or 9.9 over 15 years? I do. I feel the same way there too. So the, yeah. the I would say the best ability is affordability. That's <laughs> <laughs> and you, you can you can put you can have that one Seth. I'll, the Joe Cressera said this to me. It will steal that. And it stuck with me. Okay, I just put don't forget to mention my name on that one when you do it. The best <laughs> ability you have as a salesperson is affordability. Uh, that's the one. That's really it. I always say to people because you're surprising people. Like I get all that for like one one forty nine a month or whatever. That's gonna be. It's like well, Joe. If I said I could do it that way, what would happen then? Oh my God, what's the interest rate? What if I said I give you all this money up, up front and it would only be 9.9% interest? And here's the thing. When you incorporate, I always tell people, when you get the 9.9% interest and the, the, and the monthly payment, both the, nine, both the, the principal and the 9.9% interest you're going to pay is less money than you're currently wasting. That's, that's the key thing, thing I have to tell people mm -hmm. all the time, that we're not taking money out of your pocket. We're taking money that you're currently spending and using those resources on a small monthly basis to be able to afford this thing. And then you're going to have a better comfort, quiet, uh, a, a quieter system. Well, I'm just making your case, right? Seth, I just took over this podcast. I don't know why I did that. But I just like, you know why? Because I'm so excited about your services. Have you ever met a podcast host who's more excited about your services than me? You're definitely at the top of the list, you know? Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I, because I, 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 that's why I can never have Good Leap on enough. Because I really think this is the thing that they definitely have to make a promise to come back again sometime in the future. Okay, definitely. Is there I, anything you like to follow up with here, Seth? Of how do they how do they yeah. get a hold of you uh, to make sure? Because you sound like somebody who was able to articulate this in a way that's meaningful to the. It sounds like you. You sounds like you're the kind of person who would work with the teams uh, to train people. Tell us about the training that Good Leap does to make sure the teams uh, can get this together a little bit. Yeah, more. it's a great, great point. So we have two types of trainings. One of them is focused towards distributors and manufacturers and their field sales reps um, and helping them understand financing because a lot of these manufacturers and distributors have specialized programs. And if you're a contractor and you're listening to this and you're not aware if you have any specialized programs, it's definitely worth asking your rep, your TM, hey, do we have any financing buy downs? Do you have any financing programs? Because they're so underutilized and it's a lot of free money just sitting on the table that a lot of contractors are just leave it on the table. They don't pick it up. So if, if you're listening to this, ask your TM, ask your rep, do we have any financing buy-downs or promotions? That's a huge deal. So um, that's on the, the, the distributor side. At the contractor levels, we do two trainings for every contractor that started up with us, okay? We do an initial training, and that training is to help people understand this is how the program works, and it's to understand a little bit more about their business so that we can structure the program to the way they run their business. My goal is not to come in here and force contractors to revamp how they do things. Tell me how you do it. I'll customize my program to work with what you're doing. So that's step one, understanding your business, explaining how this works. And then we have an enrollment process. It takes about two weeks. On the back end of the enrollment process, we do a full training for all of the field sales reps, whether that's comfort advisors or selling techs or selling plumbers or whoever it is, we'll do a full training. And that can look anything from a Zoom, where we Zoom if you have, let's say, a handful of people, or if you've got a whole room that gets together, we can fly out and come in and do an on-site training uh, where we train everybody and show them how they do it. Because as you know, it's got to be easy and people have to understand how to do it. If it's not easy and they're not confident, they will never do it. So we just yeah. have to keep it extremely simple and, and make it easy to use, right? So those are really the two trainings that we do. Uh, in addition to a back office training for an admin or the the, the finance, fee, the accounting people to help them get their money. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you have the same problem that we have at uh, Service MVP is, you know, to have these great services, there's one thing. Getting people to use them is another thing, right? They, they, yeah. if yes. People use them. That's the thing about it. And I just get one final thing, guys. If you're out there in this right now thinking about it, like, man, I'm not going to add 4% to my uh my sales price is already too high and things like I'm going to put it this way, guys, you know, uh, uh, the way I would say is this, that when you're, when you're thinking that way, you're thinking in a scarcity mindset, mm -hmm. you got to say that, you know, uh, I cannot, how can I offer these premium solutions that everybody would love to have? And let's put it this way. 
your service, your installation team, it takes the same amount of energy to put a premium box as it does an economy box. So they're doing mm -hmm. the same effort. Why not give people the chance to get the economy box? Because there's zero percent chance they're going to get that unless you offer the financing or the bridge loan, we call it, or the program that Seth has in there. And I think the, one other point is that you're pre-selecting stuff for your team, like that 9.9, 15%, or maybe the 8.9, 10-year uh, loan, or that 15-year loan, or 9.9. I love that uh, loan like that. Uh, how important is it that the, the company kind of pre-selects some of these things to narrow it down for the salesperson so not too much to choose from? What do you think on that? I, I tell almost everybody, you don't need more than three or four loans max. You don't. I mean, we have 80 loans on our rate sheet. It's so confusing to people. You need three loans, right? You probably need a 12-month no interest, which only has about a 5.5% fee. You need a long-term loan, like a 15-year loan, like a 9999 and then you probably want like a five-year loan for your repairs because you can finance anything over a thousand bucks. So if I'm financing, let's say a coil replacement at two thousand dollars, maybe I'm not going to finance that for fifteen years. But I put that on a five-year note, and I'm still only looking at seventy bucks a month or so. So you need three loans. That's really all it comes down to. So, so a couple loans for the big purchases, and a smaller loan for the a shorter-term loan for the repair purchases. You know what? That's exactly what I teach. I teach people. I mean, you're, I didn't know how aligned you guys were with us because I think the same thing. I think we got to have some stuff for the for like some delayed payment stuff you could have as well as the five year loan. And then you go to the 10 and 15 year and mm -hmm. you got it there. I think that's a great way of going. This way, everybody in the team can anticipate because you can start getting into like that evaporator coil repair. It's not just that you got the refrigerant, you got the dryers, you got the you got to, you know, seal the duct work. All that stuff's going to be like, you know, Fifty-five hundred or seven thousand dollars for all that stuff. Uh, I mean, again, people are going to be shocked when you go to them. Like, hey, right now we have a fracture in your refrigerant system. It's going to be seventy-five hundred. Oh my gosh, forget it. I'm going to call somebody else. So if you don't have it that way, the next thing that's going to come out of a consumer's mouth is, "I got to shop around." Yeah. Uh, if you do, if you do it the way you're saying it, it's going to be like, "Yeah, it's ninety-two dollars a month for all that." Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, let's, let's go ahead and get it done. You know. So it's like. Uh, it's just like that. Seth, how can people get a hold of you specifically? Yeah. Uh, they always say, always say a good podcast starts on time, which I think this one did. But we got to make sure it kind of ends a great one. Ends on time. Time. Yeah, okay. you can shoot me an email. So my email is sure. So just S-U-R-E, my first initial and then my last name, sure, at goodleap, G-O-O-D-L-E-A-P.com. So sure, goodleap. That's a really good one. I love it. S-U-R-E yeah. at goodleap.com. That's a way to get a hold of Seth. And uh, Seth, thank you so much. Any final thoughts and words you have for contractors before we depart here? I would just say you're not selling HVAC systems. You're selling affordability, right? People will buy the best they can afford. And typically, they're going to do whatever is easiest. So if you make it easy and you make it affordable, you're going to close a lot of sales. Just one other thing. Tell us the kind of feeling you get when you see people report back to you about the kind of deals they write and things like that. Do you get contractor feedback from you about uh, the difference that's made in their life? Can I share one really quick story? I know we're up against the time. Go ahead, go ahead. No, take your time. Go so ahead. this was a really a gratifying experience for me, right? So several years ago, this is three to four years, I, I went out to train a, a large contractor down in uh, Theodore, Alabama. Um, some people probably know who that is because it's not a huge area and this is a big contractor. But in any case, I went in there, I was training the sales manager and um, you know, he was receptive. We trained the team. Uh, his sales at that time were something like 1.7 million a year, which in Alabama, he felt really good about. Okay. I saw him a year and a half later at a conference event. And at that event, he was getting called onto the stage to um, receive an award because he had broken the $5 million mark in annual sales, which again, in rural Alabama, that's a massive number, $5 million in residential sales. So I was at dinner that night and I was sitting there drinking. He came up, I was we're talking to this group and he says, hey, everybody here, I want you to listen to everything this guy has to say because he changed my life. When he came out and trained me, it took me from a one and a half million dollar salesperson to an over $5 million salesperson. And all I changed was exactly what he told me in terms of how to set up my financing with my selling process. So... I thought that was an amazing uh, experience. And, you know, you have experiences like that all the time where people tell you, you know, you see the growth in their business. It's really gratifying. Uh, we're both in a fortunate situation to where 
we get to help people and you get to see people grow after you help them. And it's really gratifying. It's fun to see the change. Man, if I was over there right now, I'd give you a big hug. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on here, Seth. Uh, it's been a definitely, uh, this is one of the shortest feeling podcasts. I feel like we go on for hours. I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> Let's pro promise you'll do it again with me sometime when you got some uh, yeah, yeah. new things to share. Maybe we could just do yeah. co contractor affordability stories. It'll be a good little uh, thing we could do next time. Uh, you, you up for that? I would love it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Let's do it again, Seth. Have a great one. We'll talk to you next time. Have a great one. Okay, bye-bye.